we're live. Great. Hey everybody, welcome to CKAMAs. Tonight's guest has been studying 1960s civil rights protests with particular attention to how nonviolent and violent actions by activists and police influence media, elites, public opinion, and voters. His curiosity behind racial and justice issues, including mass incarceration, drove him to studying it in depth and acquiring a PhD in African American studies at Harvard. His research focuses on race and politics, protest movements, and statistical methods. And before joining the Academy, Omar served as a regular on-air technology analyst and was the co-founder of BlackPlanet.com, an early social network and the first one to acquire over 1 million users, and he grew it to over 3 million users, which is insane and incredible in and of itself. And he also helped found a high-performing K-8 charter school in Brooklyn. So please turn your cameras on, unmute yourself, and help me in welcoming the Assistant Professor of Politics at Princeton and founder of Black Planet, Omar Waza. Welcome, hey, Omar. Folks. Thank Ooh, you. Thank Planet. you for having me. Yeah, Good I evening. saw some smiles. <laughs> I saw some big smiles when uh, Black Planet got mentioned. I'm, uh, I'm eager to hear your stories about how Black Planet, uh, you know, it influenced your, your, your life and, uh, and, 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 and in particular, like, uh, relationship to tech. Uh, but Melvin, I'll let you. I'll let you get started. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm really excited for this one. I, I, like, like you mentioned, definitely saw a lot of grins as well. So um, this is truly a special event um, tonight. And I guess one of, I guess we. So I don't know if a lot of people actually realize that. So on one hand, like, yes, you are the founder of Black Planet. And this is actually earlier on in your in your career as an entrepreneur. Um, but most recently, you've actually um, had a research paper. Sorry, I'm getting some of this background noise um, out of here. Um, so you've actually had a research paper published recently um, that's been 15 years in the making, right? And I would definitely love to um, talk about that just a little bit, to, just to give people context as to some of the things that you've been working on most recently. Um, and give them kind of a little bit of background as to what else you've been up to lately. Sure. Do you mind talking so, a little bit about, yeah, the, the work that you've been doing recently? Yeah, so I um, loved being an entrepreneur, but there were certain questions that had been kind of looping in my head from when I was a kid growing up in New York around like why we had gone from the successes of my parents' generation around civil rights, like my dad had gone and done voter registration uh, in the South as part of Freedom Summer, registering uh, people in Mississippi to vote, and um, was part of a cohort of you know young people who were changing the world. And when I was coming of age, I was like, why did we shift from this sort of era of successes with civil rights to what I saw as this kind of rising wave of tough on crime policies, mass incarceration. And as much as I love doing Black Planet, felt like that wasn't gonna, those questions weren't gonna get answered in a startup. And so went, got a PhD in African American studies with a particular interest in like what happened in the late 1960s, early 70s that we had this shift from civil rights to law and order politics. Um, and that led me to looking in particular at the protest movements of the 1960s and how they had a really profound influence on the, the, the politics both of the 60s and in the, uh, the years that followed. Um, so that led to this paper. It took me a long time to get it out, but, but after uh, more than, uh, as, you, as you noted, as, after 15 years, published it uh, at the end of May, just as the justice for George Floyd uh, protests were took off and sweeping the country, and so that that uh, research became really, you know, in a way that could never I could never have anticipated. Most social science, um, you know, about a third of it uh, is cited, you know, zero or one times, and so to have something get all of this press was a real gift. I felt very lucky, and and to be able to speak to some of the questions people are having about that moment, about how protests can be effective, was uh, was was really. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 and, and it, it felt like all that time I'd invested in that work um, was, was uh, it, 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 I'm glad it found an audience of people who are interested in it. Yeah, and what would you say are kind of um, some of those prevalent themes that either in interviews or when you're asked by people, whether it's on social media and whatnot, what, what sorts of either themes or things that you came across uh, across your research 
um, has really, you know, been brought up to the forefront that, that's been super interesting to you? Well, I think that, so, so, you know, just a um, sort of big picture, there's a, a lot of work in political science and, and in other areas that says, you know, elites dominate politics. And because elites dominate politics, marginal groups, whether it's African Americans or people with disabilities or people with HIV, uh, are, are, are so fringe and so marginalized that uh, they can't influence politics. And so one question is, like, can people at, uh, you know, who are being discriminated against or subjugated in any number of ways, can they make their mark in politics? And what I found was that, in fact, they can. And part of how they can, and, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's a, with, with John Lewis having just died, this is a, a particularly... Um, uh, you know, he, his life story kind of speaks to this. There are ways in which people can get their stories told in the media and by capturing the media's attention influence mass politics. And so what, uh, what folks like John Lewis were able to do in something like Bloody Sunday is use disruptive tactics, particularly where they made themselves the object of state violence. Um, and the way he tells it, they were dramatizing injustice, right? They were trying to like take the brutality of Jim Crow and make that visible to the entire country. And through the kinds of very strategic protest tactics they used, they were able to um, put those kinds of images, these really powerful stories in the national media. And uh, in my research, what I find is that like right around, for example, the Bloody Sunday March that happened in Selma, Alabama, there's just this massive spike in public concern about civil rights. Five months later, we see the Voting Rights Act get passed. So, so, so one question people ask a lot is, can do protests matter? I find they absolutely do. Um, and the uh, second kind of question is sort of what kinds of tactics are most effective? And what I found was that when protesters were either engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience or they were in fact uh, attacked by you know, racist cops, by white supremacist vigilantes, that made for very sympathetic press coverage and that tended to drive uh, voters and public opinion towards civil rights. When protesters engaged more aggressive resistance to white supremacy, such as uh, doing things like burning a building down um, or um, other kinds of violent resistance, that tended to generate media that was much more focused on crime and riots and crime and riots tended to move public opinion towards concerns around law and order. And so protesters, what, they're, what they were doing on the ground uh, really could move media and public opinion, um, and, and, but, but, but not always in favor of their uh, cause. And so at the same time that there was a debate in the black community about more sort of moderate integrationist tactics or more militant uh, violent resistance, um, we also saw a way to kind of test that in what happened in the later 1960s when there were more there was more violent resistance to white supremacy and that contributed in, in the evidence I find to actually the law and order coalition becoming stronger, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what protesters wanted. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, fascinating findings from, from that end. And I guess from, from kind of like a, a, um, like a third party, just a, a, an observer, there seems to be like a lot of questions that this arises, but what are sort of some of the things that you feel um, are, are really powerful to, for people to understand, especially in this um, era where there's technology and, and you obviously have, um, you know, delved into the entrepreneurial route with Black Planet. Um, what kind of role does tech play, um, especially in like this moment? So, I mean, tech, I think, is really central in a couple of ways, right? So let's, let's go like, to, in some ways, like, how do we know about George Floyd's murder, right? There's a young woman, 17 years old, Darnella Frazier, teenager, who has the presence of mind to bear witness with her camera, with her cell phone camera, to be clear, um, to this person she doesn't know being murdered on the street by a police officer, right? And so everyone having a video camera in their pocket is a really powerful way that uh, average citizens can be a check on police abuse, on uh, state violence. And so that's one really important way is that act of bearing witness, um, which we can trace back to moments like the video of the beating of Rodney King 
or even to 1955 where um, Emmett Till is murdered and the, the, the lynching of Emmett Till is a, is, a, is a horrible event, but Emmett Till's mother has the presence of mind to not just let that, uh, let that be. She fights to get his body out of the South and into Chicago. She fights to have an open casket funeral despite uh, Undertaker saying she can't do that and makes a media event of her son's uh, brutal killing and does that. So as she says, I want the world to see what I have seen, right? And so that act of allowing the world to see what I have seen can really transform politics as we saw with Darnella Frazier's video. And that's one really important way. She posts that to Facebook, um, you know, at two in the morning, not expecting to have this profound, you know, just to spawn what becomes the largest protest movement in American history, right? So that's, that's one way, is, is, is just documenting injustice uh, with the social media, with, with the, the video cameras we have, we all have in our pockets and the distribution methods we have with, with social media. Um, I think another really important thing we see is that social media acts as this, it lowers the cost of coordinating uh, you know, a, a mobilization, a, a protest. So in the past to organize a protest was non-trivial, right? Where are we gonna meet at what time, uh, you know, who's going? And now uh, we can with, you know, one person can start a text message chain or post to social media and potentially thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, people will show up at a location. And so, so that amplifies marginal voices in a really powerful way. Um, but we're also seeing technology used for repression with things like, you know, drones to monitor protesters and facial recognition technology. So it's not uniformly uh, a, a, a benefit to people trying to advance change through things like protest. Yeah. And before I go on and, and hog all of the questions here, I actually um, definitely want to leave room for the people that have joined the call to, to be able to go ahead and ask you questions. Um, but I would definitely love to, to kind of see, um, since Ruben, um, he, he never really joins these, these days, mate, so it's really exciting to see him in here. Um, Ruben, we would definitely love for you to kind of open it up with a question of your own. Yeah, nice, nice to finally meet you. I think you're... Yeah, you're, you're, pleasure yeah, is mine. Inspires me a lot, um, especially given the what you've accomplished with Black Planet, and we want to achieve similar levels, like wanting to reach a billion people in 10 years. I also like your background with understanding history and what can be done for our people. Um, and so one of the questions that I have is, you know, I agree with you that protests and riots are really important, but how do we take the protests and riots online so we can have what Huey Newton was calling for with Black Panther Party for people's community control of modern technology. So that's one thing. Also, um, since we work with a lot of companies that are hiring people in career karma, um, we're in a privileged position where all these companies are pledging billions of dollars to help our people. And they're asking people like myself and Melvin and others for advice. So what, how would you guide us in telling them how to deploy that capital to, to ha have the greatest impact for the black community outside of political things? Because to be honest with you, I don't think defunding the police is gonna happen or a lot of these types of things are gonna happen. It's gonna require like a grassroots type of efforts but that's my personal opinion. So what are your thoughts about that? So let me take the, the second question first. Um, and, and again, thank you for having me on the show. I'm really honored. I'm sorry it's taken me a while to kind of have the headspace to, to be able to focus. Summer, summer uh, is good for, for this when you're an academic. Um, so, so, I mean, if I, I think a little bit about my own career, right? I got started in tech as somebody who loved playing video games, right? And so it wasn't that I wanted to be a programmer. I, I love Donkey Kong. I'm a little, <laughs> I'm, I'm older than a lot of y'all. And, uh, and so, you know, like I wanted to make my own video games and both of my parents were educators. And so when I asked for what was then the state of the art in uh, home gaming, which was an Atari system, um, they didn't get me that. They got me something called a VIC-20, which was a keyboard where you had to program a lot of your own games in. And so each month I got a magazine that literally like I would open it and they would have programs that I would type in by hand. And then, then I, would, I could play games, but I learned by doing. Um, and I went to a public school in New York, took a, and literally like talked my way out of what I was assigned to, which was wood shop and into computer shop as it was called. Um, and, 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 and that also helped me to learn to program. 
And it wasn't like that I had access to fancy equipment. It wasn't that I had access to, you know, the, the Atari systems that my friends got, the game machines were more expensive than the, you know, keyboard that plugged into a TV that I used to learn to program. But I had parents who saw, didn't want me to just uh, play, right? Like my mom is an early childhood educator and part of her core model is like, she doesn't like games where the kids don't get to build things, right? She likes games like Lego where you get to be a creator and she doesn't like the kinds of games where it comes and it's all like, everything's pre-made. Um, and so she didn't want me to have like a cartridge I plugged in and just like, you know, played a game. I had to, I had to have something where I was, I was going from being a consumer to being a creator. That was like the heart of it for her. And so now coming back to your question, like what should we be doing in terms of, uh, you know, these kinds of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, solutions now, like at the heart of it for me is that same story of how do we help people go from being consumers to being creators? How do we give them the skills that allow them to build the future? And let me tell one more story, which is that was the heart of what we were trying to do with Black Planet, right? Like, like you came onto that site to make friends and flirt and maybe find a job. But at the heart of it, it was a social environment where in order to communicate with other people, you wanted to trick out your personal page and that meant learning HTML. And so I hear stories again and again from folks who learned more about technology because that was the kind of the language of Black Planet, right? They learned about HTML because you know, they learned to program this formatting language because that was the, the lingua franca of this, this community, right? And so, um, like, like that was for us taking people on as consumers, but giving them the Legos, giving them the building blocks to become creators of their both initially personal pages, but later careers in things like web design. So, so that to me is like, that's my kind of model is how do we train, how do we help people have those transformations? Um, and, and then, you know, what does that look like practically? If I were like, you know, you, you mentioned in your chat, right, that people are spending $1.6 billion on these programs. Well, I mean, for me, it's really fundamentally about acquiring skills and like, and helping people learn, right? And so it's like, what's going to give people the agency and autonomy to be successful in this industry and in, in, in the world more generally is, is for them to have the skills that are, that the market wants, right? And so, I don't know what the best ways to do that now are. There are lots of platforms for delivering skill, you know, for learning to program online and for kind of acquiring those kinds of, of skills. You would know the answer to that better than I would. Um, but, but for me, it's fundamentally maybe two things. One is helping people develop a kind of passion and curiosity of wanting to learn, right? So Black Planet solved that a little because if you wanted to impress your friend or impress somebody you were flirting with, you wanted to trick out your page. Um, and so there was a motivation to learn the technology. Um, but then you also want to provide people with the, the infrastructure so that they can learn, right? So we did things like rewarding people who made really awesome tutorials for HTML, right? So you could get status both by having a tricked out page, but you could also gain status by building a tutorial that helped other people learn, right? And so that's that's the, the second part. And that's that's the kind of thing where I'm guessing you uh, could could school me a little bit on what the state of the art is on that now. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's the best answer. And Melvin and I can go for days on what you just said, because I just wanted to ask the question to see if our visions were aligned, because that is consistent with what we're doing with Career Karma. I didn't realize that that was your vision as well. Um, and it, it makes sense because you're, you're a gamer, right? So a lot of times people learn skills not even realizing that they're learning something. And That's it's right. just fun to do, uh, which is key to, to us. Like even just being on this call with a lot of people you don't know, they don't even know that they're building non-technical skills. And we could talk about that later. But um, thank you for being on this call. This is this oh, call. thank thank you. And one more idea about the gamer thing, which a friend of mine shared with me, um, is an idea called hard fun. And so this is something I try to use in my teaching uh, at Princeton. It's something that uh, I think is is, is true. I mean, it, it it comes out of the gaming world. And the basic idea is, if something is too easy, you quit because it's boring. And if something is too hard, you quit because nobody wants to fail all the time. And so what, what video games understand, it turns out what uh, people who make um, uh, gambling machines also understand is that there's this sweet spot, the hard fun sweet spot where you're getting just enough reward, but you're also at the kind of edge of your abilities, right? And, and so what I would hope for anybody who's watching, who's thinking about how do I you know, build skills or how do I uh, advance my career 
is, is you want to you wanna try to find that hard fun spot. Where are you? You don't want to fail all the time because that's, again, that's no fun. But how do you get close to the edge of your ability so you're really pushing yourself and learning? Um, and at the same time, most of our educational institutions don't really understand that, right? If you've got 30 kids in a classroom, they all have, they're all somewhere different on their kind of learning curve. And so for some kids, it's a little boring. For some kids, it's too hard. And, and we need to do better at delivering education in a way that's more customized, that, that does what you just said, what games do, which allows people to learn without even realizing they're learning. Yeah, there's, um, there's so much truth and like wisdom in what you just said. There's a lot of just, um, and there's a lot of truths within just how human beings operate. And so what's super interesting with what you just said and what gamers and like the video gaming industry really do um, leverage is that human psychology of wanting to have something where there it's, it's just hard enough where they can kind of grow a little bit, you know, you need to struggle a little bit to actually grow. Um, but what you did with Black Planet and just how you just explained that is um, extraordinarily both wise, but also um, unintuitive for the most part. It's really kind of like tricking people to want to learn and like improve and like get the skills that they require or they need in order to, to pass on from being consumers to creators. So um, absolutely phenomenal. Really love that. And definitely, like Ruben mentioned, um, we could definitely go on this um, for days. So um, yeah, before we, we kind of dive into a couple of these rabbit holes, um, I definitely want to uh, get, make sure that people that are, on these call, that are on this call get their questions answered. So um, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to use the raise hands feature or drop them in the chat. I'll try to like um, quickly um, skim through these and then uh, make sure that we're, we have a nice streamline of questions coming in here. Um, but otherwise, if anyone else has a question, uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Omar. It looks like Chad um, might have had a question. All right. Yeah. Let's go with Chad. Hi, how you doing? I wanted to hey. say, what's up, Omar? Hey. And I'm, 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 I'm sitting here listening to you, and I'm, I'm upset. I'm so mad I was learning HTML and didn't even know it. You know, I, I used to trick my friends' pages out for them. These were, you know. So you, you were one of, the, you were one of the, the guys who had, who had the skills. Yeah, 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 yeah. My friends would come over. Hey, man, oh, yo, fix my page up like yours. And, you know, I, I, you know, that'd be a, that'd be a lot of Friday and Saturday nights. You know, Black Planet took me from my from my teens to adulthood. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really but, um, pleased but to hear I'm that. interested um, to finding out what did you learn in your study between you know the civil rights generation and Generation X. For example, I grew up in a place called Plainfield, New Jersey in a middle class community. Like um, when I was young, I could ride my bike as far as I could in any direction. And these were nothing but black homeowners. And then and somewhere in like the nineties, like you just started seeing foreclosure signs come in. The next thing you know, now the town is, you know, um, half, 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 sp uh, half Spanish, you know? Um, and I just, you know, like um, when my father was 31, he bought his house. And he's wow. one of only few people I know that still owns his house to today. Yeah. A lot of people, especially 2007, knocked yeah. a lot yeah. of people out. Yeah. So I yeah. was interested in finding out um, what did you learn in, in your study? It's a great question. Let me, let me, let me come back to the beginning of your comment just to say thank you for supporting Black Planet and having, having been somebody you know, who was one of those educators on the platform, helping others learn. Um, and it, you know, those, those, those stories warm my heart. So I just I thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and then on the question of kind of like what happened in the post-civil rights era, I mean, what you're describing, uh, particularly in the like 2008 period where uh, 2007, 2008, when there was the economic collapse, like part of what's been so hard is that there's like, like, like basically black America is getting, um, becoming a part of America more broadly, right as things like deindustrialization start to hit in the 1970s, right as um, there starts to be the, you know, I mean, this is not coincidence, the rise of the war on drugs that really devastates the black community. And so what we see is a kind of, there are a couple of trends that hit where you know, now you see deindustrialization hitting white America, but essentially black America was the canary in the coal mine for a set of economic dislocations that, 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 that hit the black community first. 
Um, and so what that meant was things like the historic wealth gap that have been there forever, particularly began to, for the bottom half of the black working class become even worse in the post-civil rights era, right? The black middle class often moved out and that made things worse for the folks left behind. You have things then like um, deindustrialization, which mean that money, you know, there, there, there's just cities throughout the uh, kind of industrial heartland that used to have lots of good kind of middle-class jobs and those left uh, black communities or kind of, you know, neighborhoods proximate to black communities in a way that devastated those communities. Um, and then now they're leaving uh, many of the white communities as well. So, you know, that, that's what we're seeing uh, places like Ohio, uh, you know, tip towards folks like Trump, but in part because they're, they're getting devastated too by deindustrialization. So, so there's a broad set of trends that have been hitting America over decades, but they hit, they hit the black community first. Um, and then, and then more narrowly, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to belabor this, but things like the law and order policies enacted, the, the tough on crime, the war on drugs policies started by Nixon uh, in in uh, the late '60s and early '70s, essentially created this massive apparatus of mass incarceration that that has uh, you know really devastated the black community. And so that's some of what we're seeing in this in the protest waves now is an attempt to try and push back on that really punitive policing and punitive criminal justice policy, but um, it's been decades in the making and it's gonna be, it's gonna be decades to unravel. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Chad. It uh, looks like Stephanie, yeah, you can go ahead, ask your question. Okay. Um, so this is kind of loaded, but so like you were speaking about the the importance of uh, you know becoming creators and, as opposed to consumers and Black Planet um, definitely saw some things that I shouldn't have seen uh, on Black Planet, but <laughs> shout out to that. Uh, but but what happened is there was there was a time for uh, for for Black creators, right? So uh, but then even on a larger you know brick and mortar industrial scale. Um, talk about reconstruction, uh, talk about like uh, Black Wall Street, these different kind of things that did happen. However, like just from a intergenerational trauma standpoint, like seeing things get built up, even bookstores, Black bookstores, like get built up and then torn down, built up, torn down. And it's not like Black people haven't tried to create another Twitter, because people always like, all black people should create Twitter, and it's like they have black people really made Vine. The black Black Twitter, you know, like Black Twitter itself is a thing that like you know exists inside of this ecosystem. But when you try to take it outside on these other platforms, it just hasn't worked uh, for whatever reason. And even like mentioning Emmett Till, then that being in Jet Magazine. So like owning your own narrative. So then now when you see that like, then so Essence, Jet, I think, uh, no, I think Essence just got their ownership back. But like Ebony, like all these places where this, you talk about the narrative, right? Like, uh, like being shaped and then being changed and then being wiped away. So then now like, what are your thoughts on, okay, say we have the tools and skills to create, but then how do we, maintain ownership uh knowing the history that every it always gets torn down so it's a great question and i think there has been a lot of you know progress and regress is what i hear in your question right there was yeah. a wave of uh you know a century of black newspapers that made a really important contribution in fighting segregation and fighting uh lynching and fighting uh, uh, discrimination in the yeah, north. Ida B. Wells. Ida yeah, B. Wells, yeah. right. Um, and uh, and so you can draw a thread from that to the black magazines that you were just mentioning, uh, you know, the, the Ebony's and the Essences and the uh, Jets and the important, you know, work they did, pioneering work to, to give a platform to, to black voices. And I think we're in a moment now where they're kind of two weird competing, not even competing, but kind of parallel trends, right? So one is a kind of consolidation where um, you know there's 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 a, a kind of monopoly power that 
a company like Facebook or a company like Google or a company like Amazon has, where there's not going to be, um, you know, there aren't two kind of equivalent Googles. There aren't two equivalent Facebooks. There's sort of one dominant player in each of these spaces. And then the second or third uh, player tends to be much smaller. And so Twitter uh, you know, is, is much smaller relative to Facebook. And there are lots of online shopping sites relative to Amazon. But, but, but um, the, it, you know, so there are these giants. Um, but then at the same time, there's this like flourishing of newsletters and like people can acquire, you know, a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. And, and so it's like, you can have these niche voices have bigger platforms than they might've ever had before. And so, you know, what I guess I would say in terms of like what I would do, I mean, in some ways it is what I do, um, is to try and build my own platform. And as one person wrote years ago, don't hate the media, become the media. Um, and so, you know, I am trying to use the tools that are there to, you know, amplify my own voice. And that means sometimes I get an opportunity like this. Sometimes it means I get an opportunity to, you know, be on CNN, but other times I'm just, you know, I'm saying what I want to say on, 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 on Twitter. And that's, that's a platform that's useful for me to get my voice heard. Um, and, and I'm just trying to work on multiple fronts and, and that can turn in for some people to a business like you know, a Patreon or a Substack where they have people helping to fund their writing or creativity. And so, you know, I think in some ways, uh, as one person put it, thinking in terms of tech industry, you want to be, it's, it's okay to be a flea on an elephant. Um, and, and, and that the idea is you're, you know, if you can make a living as an artist through GoFundMe or Patreon or Substack or whatever it is, that's, that's an awesome thing to be able to pull off in this day and age, you know, whether you know, Kickstarter and so on. And, and, and I think that would be part of what I would try to do is, if, if, is, is, is to figure out how can I build a community that wants to support the, you know, my creativity or my writing. Um, and that's not easy, but it's easier now than it probably has ever been in the past. And, and that would be the kind of, um, I, I, you know, I would want to, I would take that niche approach and not worry necessarily about trying to compete with the giants because there aren't that many, there's just not a lot of room to compete with the giants. I agree with you. Um, but I think there is room for new kinds of voices to, to, to build new audiences. And, uh, and, and Twitter's never going to compete with the niches. Um, and Facebook isn't, you know, they're going to be a platform upon which those other people can build communities and potentially businesses. Thank you. Yeah. That um, that definitely was super powerful. Um, I'm curious to hear what what do you advise folks that maybe, you know, they're they're not really in that mindset yet from like in in their journey of becoming um, a creator rather than a consumer or a you know hater of the media to a, you know a, a powerful media entity and in of a, in and of themselves. Um, what is that kind of progression look like and, and how would you advise people to get started? So I, I, you know, I'm an, I'm a professor. I believe deeply in education. And so, um, and I also think a lot of these things take years to acquire. Right. So I'm, um, so let me, let me tell one other story that's not directly about tech, but ultimately comes back to it. So, um, I grew up, I, I mentioned earlier, both my parents were educators and there was a moment in my life where kind of learning went from being relatively easy to being really challenging and I didn't know what to do. And I kind of struggled when confronted with like a feeling of like writing wasn't easy or turning that paper in wasn't easy. Um, and I had times where I choked and I choked badly. And it took me a long time to figure out what was going on, you know, taking incompletes in classes and really struggling to kind of get through certain kinds of educational experiences. And I read some work by a scholar named Carol Dweck and what she uh, spells out, which was really helpful for me, is, a mo is two models of learning, right? So uh, one way of thinking about learning is you have a fixed amount of intelligence and you can't really do anything to adjust that intelligence. And so if something is hard, you often, going back to that hard fun idea, you pull back from it, right? Um, but another way of thinking about learning is that actually you can get better at things if you keep at them and that if you encounter a challenge, that's an opportunity to learn. And, uh, and so you might keep doing challenging things because that's gonna uh, allow you to kind of, as you said earlier, like the hard stuff is where you build skills. So she talks about that as a fixed mindset, the idea that like, you know, I'm good at something or I'm bad at something. 
Um, and then the other idea is a growth mindset. If I, you know, in, in, in the kind of the bumper sticker version of what she describes is um, smart is something you do, not something you are, or effort makes ability is the shortest version of it. Right. And so when I learned about this, I was like, oh, this really helps me understand the challenges I've faced with learning because I basically hit these moments where it was hard. I had this kind of fixed mindset about it, like either I'm good at it or I'm not. And, and I kind of pulled back when I didn't feel like I was good at it. And what she's shown in studies, uh, you, know, you know, really dozens of studies over a lifetime of work is that you can take like a nine-year-old kid, a 10-year-old kid, and you um, have them take a test. They all do well on the test. You have like 100 kids. Um, and you tell literally, it's as simple as this. There's a one sentence uh, uh, intervention. Some kids are told you did well on that test. You must be really smart. Um, and at random, other kids are told you did well on that test. You must work really hard, right? And then they're offered another test, which is uh, they can pick, do you want to do one like the one you just did, which is to say easy, or do you want to do a more challenging one? And what they find again and again is that the kids who are told that they're smart prefer to take the easier tests. And the kids who are told that they work hard prefer to do the more challenging work. And what we have in our educational system and our culture is a world that tells black and brown people, tells women, oh, you, you, you have a you know, fixed ability at math or you have a fixed ability at like these technical things. And rather than, you know, that, that's like pervasive in our culture, even if it's never said explicitly. Um, and, and so I, I think part of overcoming my own challenges also speaks to a kind of larger challenge in our culture, which is how do we develop a growth mindset that allows us to say, okay, this is hard, but if I keep at it, I'm gonna learn and I'm gonna keep learning. And so I had moments, I did a master's in statistics at Harvard, and there were moments early on in my training where I just thought, I, I don't understand what's going on. I don't have like the math gene or the stats gene or whatever it is. Um, and I thought about quitting. And I, I remembered this work by Carol Dweck. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, uh, I, I, you, you mentioned I was on the board of a charter school. And like, I remember talking to a third grader who was like, I can't do fractions. Right. And I was just like, oh, no, it's just like, you know, think pizza pie or whatever it is. Right. And her mind was like, no, no, I, 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 I cannot do fractions. And I realized, no, no, that's how I'm reacting to, you know, graduate level statistics. I was saying I can't do it. But that's that's I just that's a story I tell. And I told myself a different story, which is if I keep at it, you know, I might not be the best in this class, but I'm going to be better than I was when I started. And I ended up doing in the end 10 classes and I got my master's and, you know, now I teach statistics. Right. And so, um, the, you know, the, 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 it lo is a long story, um, but, but the kind of the core of it is the way you go from being a create consumer to a creator is you learn stuff, you, you acquire skills, you work towards mastery, and that's a lifetime project. But each day you get a little bit better, each day you are better than you were the last day is progress. And like that to me is the, the heart of it. And so if you have a passion for learning, if you have a kind of willingness to kind of keep doing that work, um, you will get better. And as you get better, you will, you will, you will, you know, move closer to the, the level of mastery that allows you to be somebody who's sort of in, you know, thriving professionally and able to do what Chad was saying earlier, teach other people. Um, and that, that, that to me is the path. Yeah, that, um, is definitely a, um, you just pulled on a thread that's like very close to my heartstrings here. It's, it's definitely this growth mindset and um, constantly like asking more, more and more of yourself and growing and learning and really like enjoying that process and acquiring the skill set that allows you to not only serve yourself, but to serve others. And that um, ties like all hand in hand with just um, fulfillment and, and really feeling like you're finally getting to the level of autonomy that you're, that you're seeking. So um, that was beautifully said. And Thank you. I, I guess another um, thing that I would definitely love to, to kind of talk, touch upon is um, since you've actually spent um, quite some time within academia, it'd be interesting to hear your take on where you feel um, higher education college is heading um, given the fact that most of them will probably be online, um, you know, given recent events. And over, you know, 51 million Americans have filed for unemployment since March 
uh, people are beginning to scrutinize um, these types of decisions more as outcomes driven education stands out as a more um, lucrative and attractive path. So I'm definitely interested to kind of hear your take on that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I think there are a lot of things that happen in something like college, right? So some of it is you acquire skills um, that are marketable, you know, for a job. Some of it is you make friends potentially for life that help you personally and professionally. Some of it is you become an adult in a, you know, an environment where there's some room to be uh, older, uh, you know, more independent and mature, but with still some guardrails. Um, and, you know, and, and you can't deliver all of that online, right? So, um, but uh, for somebody who, you know, maybe is, has a kid or has to do character giving for, you know, a parent or maybe needs to work part time, there are a lot of things that are really advantageous about the opportunities to learn either in a self-directed way through some of the services that are like, you know, everything from YouTube to uh, web-based tools that allow you to kind of, you know, practice and tinker and learn as you go um, to more formal kind of online education. And so I'm, I'm actually really excited about how technology might democratize access to high quality education, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, and, and I think a lot of it will look more like gaming. So for example, um, the, you know, if we were going to teach, uh, you know, you're going to teach your niece how to play chess, you wouldn't say, okay, here's a book uh, you know, like read about chess, right? You'd sit down and you'd say, here's how you move a piece and you'd play and you'd practice a little and then you'd build up and maybe you'd have uh, her play against somebody who's at about her level. And then, right, and you'd, you, you, would, you would learn by playing as, as Ruben said before. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to build a lot more infrastructure for that kind of um, learning by playing. And, and we don't, we, unfortunately, a lot of what we see right now in terms of online education is really trying to replicate a traditional classroom. There's a lecture, there's homework. Um, and I don't think that's really the, I mean, that's not a bad thing, but I think it's kind of one element of probably what needs to be, uh, you know, at least a half dozen different kinds of pieces that are, how do you, how do you learn by playing? How do you learn in a social way, you know, by helping others, as Chad was saying earlier, and then kind of asking you questions that push you? How do you learn by, um, by, by um, uh, you know, by in some cases working through a problem on your own and, and sometimes uh, asking a question of somebody like, you know, a professor. And so, so what I hope is we move towards a world where there's a little bit more of that kind of electronic tutor uh, social community learning and and learning by playing um, and there's definitely some of that on the internet now but I, 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 I look forward to a future where there's more of it yeah, yeah. I, I definitely see a world where um, education will look more like gaming or you have the community it's, it's fun it's easy you have the reward system like you were talking about before um, a lot of and just to not monopolize the conversation but just something briefly um, I played a cello so I, I started with the Suzuki method where it functions off of the philosophy that every child can versus just you have to be born with these gifts and be taught cut by being a prodigy and there's this big philosophy that you learn how to speak before you learn how to read because same the way that you learn a language and then you start reading books and then you get confused and so like i think what you're talking about just kind of like learning over time is a big deal so i i don't know if you studied every child can but if this is something that's big for you um, I like Carol Dweck and Mindstorms and stuff like that. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna revisit that, and and you've you've brought a lot of really good points to the table. Well, and I'll I'll look at the every child can. That sounds right up my alley. Um, and I think you know, and I think we need to, you know, we, we need to sort of advocate around kind of two fronts. One is that we want a lot more folks in the world of tech who have who acquire these STEM skills, right? And so so there's a we want to kind of build a a bigger pipeline. Um, but we also want to make sure that the kinds of educational experiences people have are welcoming and encouraging them to invest in the years of learning. Let me, let me, let me shift gears for a second and come back to your point. There was an article in Inc. Magazine years ago about a guy who uh, was trying to figure out how to um, build essentially a programming paradise. And, um, and what he realized is they, they were recruiting people from all over the world to this uh, place they had set up. I think it was in the Bahamas. And 
that because the technology changes all the time, what they realized is they, they, they couldn't just hire like the best programmer and whatever it was like C, they needed somebody who just loved learning. And that person would pick up whatever the new programming language was in 18 months that they needed for some new client. Um, and so I think that's where it's like, like we need to build better educational infrastructure, but we also need to like help people develop their own mental kind of models for learning that allow them to kind of just have a passion for learning and to realize like, oh, like when I feel stupid sitting in front of the computer, not knowing what's going on, that's okay. Everybody has that. And that's part of the experience of learning. And what we need is to like not give up and just kind of like keep noodling, have people we can call for a lifeline, search, you know, stack overflow, or whatever it is, and get, get past that and keep going. And you can develop that kind of uh, mental uh, I don't want to call it toughness, but it's like, you know, resilience or kind of, uh, again, the kind of that growth mindset, then it's possible to like sit with those challenges and, and be somebody who just keeps uh, getting better over time. And, um, and that, so that, that for me is like, I, I, I used to uh, run marathons and one year, I was never, you know, particularly competitive. One year there was a sign at, uh, at the registration for the New York marathon that was um, last place still beats never entered. And that was like, hey, that's me. I've, I've, I may not, I may not, you know, set any records, but last place beats never entered. And I think we need to kind of uh, think about education in that way too, right? Being in the game is a way to get better and getting better is you being a better version of yourself each day and being a better version of yourself each day is going to be both personally rewarding and has the potential to be professionally rewarding too. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is definitely turning out to be one of those AMAs for the books. Um, uh, so we do have uh, a, a few minutes here uh, left. So I definitely want to make sure that we get at least a couple more questions answered. But I think that there's also something very important to touch upon um, in terms of your views on uh, the notion of law as code. So within the intersection of even your careers, right? Like so you went down this entrepreneurial path of creating this a social network and yet you ended up going down the path of finding a little bit more about it from like a, um, you know, politics side and, and political science and learning African-American studies and statistics. Right. And so all of these different elements of your um, academic career and just learning, right. And, and being a part of that, uh, how has that kind of influenced um, your perception of, what the right way forward is. Um, is the law kind of like a different form of code or technology? Yeah, that's a great way of framing it. So, I mean, I, I guess the simplest way I think about this is that there are a lot of different kinds, if we think of technology in a really broad sense, right? Like, you know, a stick that allows you to, uh, you know, hunt an animal is a kind of technology, right? It enhances uh, human capacities and that I think of law and government as another kind of invention, which allows humans to thrive, right? So having um, you know, a contract that allows us to work together and have stable rules is a kind of human invention that allows us to uh, potentially you know, collaborate in a way that makes us more productive than we might've been without that certainty, right? So, so law is a, is a human invention. It is a kind of technology and it is a kind of technology that can be profoundly uh, you know, advantageous when it works to uh, you know, sort of support human uh, thriving, but it can also clearly, as we've seen in the history of things like Jim Crow and segregation, be used against uh, in particular African-Americans, but, but, but historically, you know, it could be anybody, uh, indigenous folks, immigrants, uh, uh, you name it, right? People who are uh, you know, gay and lesbian, um, and so, so law as a technology is this incredibly powerful tool that uh, can enhance or, 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 or restrict, uh, you know, uh, human potential. And I think for a lot of the issues that the black community faces, um, but, but again, beyond just the black community, any group that's kind of locked out of opportunity, technology will get us part of the way, but we really have to think about, uh, other kinds of innovation, right? So by technology, I mean, right, we sort of think of like the things you plug in as technology, but there's this other realm of technology, which is, as, as, as you were saying, the code that is like the legal code. And that legal code is doing a lot to, um, you know, create 
opportunity or not, right? So in a place like Ferguson, where Michael Brown uh, was killed by um, you know, a police officer, uh, it turns out people did a study, it had the high, people were being fined for, you know, your grass is too tall, you have a sign in your lawn, I mean, all kinds of BS that was leading people to uh, do, you know, the question from Chad earlier, right? You would lose your home because you had too many fines or you would avoid the police because if somebody pulled you over, you would have tickets again, you know, you didn't have turn a turn signal. In any case, Ferguson had among the highest rates of fining its citizens of any uh, city in the country. And that, that, that problem isn't gonna be solved by an app. That problem is gonna be solved by changing the legal structure so that people aren't being harassed and fined uh, to within an inch of their lives, right? And um, we can think about the kinds of policies, you know, in policing now, right? So there's something called qualified immunity, where it's exceedingly hard to hold police officers accountable. And that's not, that's not gonna be solved by an app. I mean, again, things like video cameras in a phone that document uh, police violence, those are helpful, but fundamentally to really make change, qualified immunity needs to be reformed or abolished or, you know, like, like, like basically like eliminated. Um, and that's, that's in the legal code, not in the software code, not in, not in anything we plug in. Um, and so I, I, I kind of, part of why I went into political science and African American studies was I wanted to think about this other set of human innovations that we need to think about really profoundly kind of re, rewriting, recoding, um, and, uh, and that that wasn't going to happen just in the tech world. I think tech folk have a lot to say, partly because they have platforms, partly because they you know, may have wealth, partly maybe because uh, they have insights about how change can happen, but it's not fundamentally going to happen because somebody builds a new app. Like We actually need to change laws. We need to elect different kinds of district attorneys and different kinds of, of uh, you know, mayors and, 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 and members of the national government. And, and until those things happen, um, you know, the, the, the app economy, the internet economy isn't, isn't likely to really get the change we want. Yeah, that, that's definitely um, rather well thought out. And, and I think that even from like a, a technological standpoint, right? Like a social network um, can be seen sort of under the same light and under the same fervor. So with the the platform that you built within um, Black Planet, right? If someone is able to kind of leverage a platform to really um, educate its people to like, this is how you actually make real change within the code of like law that, that actually has, you know, profound impact on, on your day-to-day -day life, um, then that's a rather, you know, well use of, of that platform. Um, uh, yeah, definitely a uh, very interesting. Um, does, does anyone else have a couple of questions here for Omar as we close out with these last five minutes? Now we have a couple. Um, we do have a couple in the chat as well. I can, I can go ahead and um, dig through these as well. Um, let's see here. Ruben, did you have any other um, last questions as well or any other things before we close off yeah so a lot of people are saying that right now there's um there's the right energy for a new social network to come out um and a lot of people are talking about community um and so like what would you say so like let's assume everybody on this call has the skills that they need in order to build their own platform they have the right team what would you say we got to do in order to build community that um doesn't doesn't exploit our people, but empowers them going forward? It's a great question. Um, so, so let me begin first with a negative answer and then get to the positive, right? So the challenge is that you've got these, uh, you know, elephants uh, in Facebook and Twitter and Instagram that are gonna, that, that have basically uh, commandeered a huge amount of internet real estate, right? So you've got to figure out what is, the, and I think you're right, I, I get this question a lot now of people want some alternative to Facebook. Um, and I think the challenge is to figure out like, what are they not doing, right? What is, what is, what is it that, um, that is an opportunity that they're not exploiting? And, um, and clearly part of that, you know, what we had with Black Planet that gave us something defensible was like, they're, they're, you know, it's like, there are different kinds of social experiences, right? Why do conservatives want a, uh, 
I'm forgetting what it's called, but there's some Twitter competitor, uh, oh, par Parlay, I think they're calling it, um, is uh, why, 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 why might they want a private space? Well, you know, like sometimes you want to have a kind of big group conversation. Sometimes you want to have an in-group conversation. And what we saw with Black Planet is that like there was a real pleasure in being in a site that was about 90% Black. And um, so I think there's, you know, that's, that's one potential point of differentiation, um, but I don't think it's enough. Um, and so I think I would want to really try to figure out like what is the, to use a, a phrase from a, a business school professor named Clay Christensen, what is the job to be done? Um, and so the, the work that he does, this, this guy Clay Christensen says, you know, you're really trying to figure out like what problem, what's the, what's the specific problem people have that's not being solved by these other services? Um, and, um, and it's okay if that's niche. I think it's actually probably essential that it's niche, right? In the early days of the web, we used to say, get big, get niche, or get out. Um, and, uh, and this is one of those cases. Okay, well, they're already the folks who are big, but there's still opportunities to own something niche. Um, but you still, but I, I would, I would want to know, like, what, what is it that people can't do well on those other services that, that they want to do that you can solve? I mean, that, you know, in some ways, that's standard startup stuff. Um, but, but, uh, but it's, like, it's, 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 it's harder now than it was when we launched Black Planet because when we launched Black Planet, you know, people didn't even, people thought that social media was like you going to the library and reading an encyclopedia, right? Like in 1999, when we launched Black Planet, like the dominant idea about the internet was the um, information superhighway, right? So people were like, people are gonna like, I mean, people were so skeptical, A, that, you know, the dominant story was the digital divide. So people were like, there are no black folk online. It's like, people used to tease me like, who's gonna do this, Omar? You and the three other black nerds in America? Um, and it's like, just you wait, just you wait, right? Millions of us are coming. And, um, but the other thing was that like, you know, using, you know, think about what, what is it? It's a web page, right? So we had to hack that to make it a social experience. Um, and uh, and so, so we were at a time where it was still kind of like, you know, unclaimed territory. And now it's just, you know, it, it's a world where the big uh, sites have, 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 you know, really dominated. So you've got to figure out what's the, what's the niche that you can claim that's serving a, a, a need that's not well met. Um, and that would be the, 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 the kind of the thing I would loop on. Because I think you're right that the technical parts actually, you know, there are open source platforms now that allow you to build a kind of Facebook in a box. Um, so so what, what is the niche you're going to serve that uh, can overcome the network effects where everybody's like on Facebook because all their friends are on Facebook, right? Um, and that, that would be, or, or, or what's the technical thing that people can't do on these other services that, that uh, you, you, could, you could solve? Yeah, I, I definitely hope a lot of you are taking notes here. Um, you all are acquiring a skill set that will allow you to build things like this. So I would love to, to kind of hear and, and see some of the wonderful things you all um, tend to or will end up building yourselves. Um, it, unfortunately, we have run out of time here. But um, before I ask my last question, Omar, where can people find you? Probably the easiest way to interact with me is on Twitter. So I'm just uh, first initial last name, O-W-A-S-O-W, -O -O, Owasso at, uh, at Owasso on Twitter. Um, and uh, I, I, you can also reach me an email, Owasso at Gmail. Um, but, um, but Twitter's probably the easiest place to interact. And, um, and, and uh, you know, and I'm not, I, I should be clear, I'm not in the tech space anymore. I kind of like, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an OG in the sense that I'm an original geek, um, but, uh, but, 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 you know, the, the youngins have taken over the game and I'm, I'm, I'm an old professor now. So, I, so you if you have a startup you. idea, I'm probably not the person uh, to talk to because I haven't been following the latest uh, stuff. But, uh, but, but love to talk about Black Planet or you know, statistics or the war on drugs uh, and, uh, and, 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 and protests and then doing that a lot on Twitter. Great. So Omar, this last question is geared so that the folks that are on this call don't just listen to the words that you have to say um, and it coming in one ear and out the other um, for lack of a better word, um, but rather that they take uh, your advice and, and implement it into their lives if they can even this week. So what, in your opinion, is one thing that people can do this week that'll help them move closer towards their goal of breaking into tech? So 
I relate to this in a way that uh, may not be obvious, but so I mentioned I've been teaching statistics and I teach and, and statistics today is a lot like programming because a lot of the uh, you, 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 you learn some kind of math, but then it all gets implemented in writing scripts in a, in a programming language. And even though I've been doing this now for 15 years, I still am always like, oh, here's something I've always wanted to be able to do and I still can't quite figure it out. And so I each week am doing small projects that in some cases are not much more than like copy, you know, it's, it's, it's actually very much like what I did as a kid, right? I'm copying somebody else's code and getting it to see if I can run it on my computer and then trying to understand what's going on in that script. And I do that all the time. And so my encourage, my recommendation to people, whatever you're trying to learn to do, and it doesn't have to be code related, um, you know, maybe it's a design thing or maybe it's uh, some other kind of, uh, uh, you know, science or technical uh, kind of, of project, but, but figure out what's like a small chunk of something that you admire that somebody else does that you'd like to learn, see if you can reproduce it on your computer, um, and then see if you can understand what the steps are in it. And, and, it, and it sort of doesn't matter how small it is. In fact, in some ways I recommend it being quite small because that's the way you can figure it out and master it and then kind of level up to the next, you know, slightly harder version of that. So, so there's, there's a, 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 a joke, um, uh, I've seen it as a t-shirt and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a fake uh, O'Reilly book that's like, um, basically like, you know, how do I learn? Like I copy stuff on Stack Overflow and then I, and, and then I figure it out. And that's, that's a lot of what I'm doing too. It's what a lot of very advanced programmers do. Um, and I think it's a way to kind of keep pushing yourself, find small chunks of things that you want to understand, copy the code, uh, you know, reverse engineer it, um, and, then, and then level up. I love that. I think it's super tactical and I hope um, that everyone on this call definitely follows up with that and tweet at him at O Wazo. So let him know what you all end up copying and reproducing and understanding. Um, step by step, you'll go down that path of mastery and you'll just turn around and be like, wow. So um, really appreciate you spending an hour uh, uh, with us here, Omar. And um, to all of you that joined us on this call, you all just um, invested an hour of your time um, towards your futures and just listening to a lot of the wisdom that Omar's um, gleaned over the past 15 years studying some really important um, topics. So um, thank you all. And Omar, again, thank you for joining us. Really, really and grateful for the opportunity. Absolutely. All right. Well, until next time, everyone, um, good night.